So I thought I'd do a, a video on where I've got to with my Buddhist practice over the past 12 years. So a sort of subtitle to this video is 12 years of Buddhist, Buddhist, rather than 12 years of slave. But, um, and I'm just sort of looking at the, uh, I think it's the London Buddhist Society. They've done, they have videos of folk who've discovered Buddhism and they wander up to the dais and give a brief chat about how they got there and why and so forth. So I'm sort of following that, that lead. So certainly back in the 1960s, when I was sort of searching for spiritu spirituality and such like, and um, I think I tried, I tried looking at Buddhism and I think the best known Buddhist at that stage in England was probably a chap called Christmas Humphreys, which is a name that quite resonates. Um, I think I actually did get a book out by him, but it's one of those books that tried to obfuscate rather than illuminate. So, uh, you know, I mean the man no disrespect, but it seems to be more showing off his knowledge rather than to, to impart the knowledge. But I may be wrong about that, but uh, I gave up after a few pages. And then when I looked at the man's profession, he was in fact a chief prosecutor for the British Crown. And this is at a time when um, the death penalty was mandatory for murder. Uh, so he was, if you're not helping to perpetrate executions of people which didn't sort of re resound too well with me from my understanding of what Buddhism was about. And um, I suppose my first epiphany or revelation uh, about where to go with life was in 1969, standing at the side of the road somewhere in France, hitchhiking and thinking, it's at the age of 21, what am I doing here, standing at the side of the road hitchhiking? I should be doing something with my life. And um, I suppose uh, later on, reading up on Google, I, th I sort of discovered what, I, what I'd come across is existentialism. And uh, the existentialist existence, I suppose, satisfied all. I lived with that for the next, um, gosh, I don't know, 35, 40 years or so. And um, uh, I'm not saying that I moved from existentialism straight into um, Buddhism. Certainly in, I think, 1972, I gave a try to what was um, a fad in those days, well, fad's probably the wrong word, but uh, transcendental meditation from the Maharishi Yoga. So I went to this house in uh, part of England and learnt some uh, words and, and some indication on what transcendental meditation was. So I, I was using that for 35 years or more. I'm not in any sort of uh, religious way. Religious, I, I mean, it's, it's more I knew how to do it sort of 20 minute sessions, morning and evening, which I did sometimes, not others. So I didn't do religiously in that regard. And, uh, but the second epiphany uh, came to me in September, 2007. And it, it, led, it, it came from reading an article on the internet. Now it used to be a, quite a, a reasonably nice program called Stumble Upon and some older folk watching this might remember it. And basically you just fed into the computer or the internet on this site called TumblePon your, what your interests were. So could I say, I don't know, cars, philosophy, politics, news, history, science, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you'd hit the button and it would randomly pop up with the topic on, your cho on the chosen subjects. And one of them was a, a, a website by a chap called Peter Russell, who was a philosopher, and um, he uh, had a section about Buddhism. And really, that was the start, and it all led from there. 
and I was very lucky. I'm, I'm living in New Zealand, and uh, I am probably about 25 minutes drive from probably one of the largest established Buddhist monasteries in New Zealand, and uh, it was quite good to make contact with what you call real Buddhists, the monks and so on and so forth, who were at this modest monastery. At the time I first went there it was a chap called Ajahn Teradama, Canadian, um, who's now back in Canada, but at the time he was the abbot of the monastery. And um, it was a Theravada monastery of the Ajahn Chah persuasion, uh, or tradition shall I say. And uh, it sort of begs the question, why did I go Theravada rather than Zen or Mahayana or of the other uh, paths to Buddhism? And I think to say that it was um, Theravada, I say A, because it was the closest monastery. Uh, but also it, it struck me off reading about the different branches of Buddhism that it seemed to be closer to the earlier tradition. Um, I suppose from a Christian background, I would say probably say the Society of Friends would be the Christian equivalent. Um, and uh, one thing that sort of it not puzzled me, but I had a I suppose yeah, I had a query about was in the Mahayana tradition. From the way I read it, or maybe misunderstanding it, is there's no end to rebirth until everybody has achieved re, um, an end to rebirth. So it wasn't like you became a arahant or a, um, free of uh, the re, free of the uh, life and death cycles, samsara. Uh, it was more um, that everybody everybody had to be free to achieve that final um, life. Now, I may be being selfish saying, think, well, if I achieve it, I'm not waiting for everybody else. <laughs> but I, th I, I assume they took that because from what I understand when uh, Buddha achieved enlightenment, and I think it's about the age of 30, that he, he had the, the, cho the big choice to make of either becoming a recluse <clears throat> for the rest of his life or spend the rest of his life trying to teach others. And he chose the life to try and teach others how to become arahants. And maybe the Mahayana tradition took that view as well, that we should all be trying to assist others before we um, pass through non-rebirth. So the Theravada Mahayana schism well, there doesn't seem to be any ill feeling between the two, but um, I suppose that I found it akin to say in the Islam tradition between the Shiite and Sunni schism, or in the Christian religion between the Roman Catholics and the Greek Orthodox. Um, so uh, I went to the monastery after I'd you know, read a few books and got a, a reasonable handle on. What Buddhism was all about, but they uh, they d did have this is back in two thousand and seven, about, yeah, about twelve years, twelve thirteen years ago. Uh, every first Saturday of every month, they'd have a a four hour introductory meditation session, and so I went along for my first one. Oops, just got a message coming in on my phone. Hang on a sec, gone. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, so I went to the monastery on the Saturday afternoon, 1pm, 1, 1 or arrived a little bit late. Now, obviously I wasn't familiar with the practice, so I went wearing a summer's day, being the southern hemisphere, and uh, I was wearing shorts, which is a bit of a no-no, and I'd arrived late, so I had to sort of walk in quietly to this large hall at the monastery, the meeting hall, or sala. And uh, this, I say, is, a, is a, it's not a sort of converted house. This is a proper monastery with a, a purpose-built um, meeting hall and in the Thai style with um, wooden walls and the ability to open the windows and open the walls out to get let fresh air and such like. But anyway, so there I was. There was about five or six people sitting there cross-legged on the floor. So I thought, well, I'd better 
joined them and I sort of sat down and within 20 minutes my left hip was giving me absolute jip. <laughs> so um, I, all I could think about was the pain from my left hip and that wasn't just some that I've had that for many years. So um, I retreated, retreated to the back of the hall where there were some seats to sit on and uh, I, I I didn't feel I had a place doing that because, in fact, the abbot uh, also he had a, in fact had a bad knee, so he couldn't sit cross-legged either. So he was sitting in a chair. So that was quite um, quite nice that I didn't feel I had a place doing that. And I went on in uh, about three or four months later. I went to a five-day meditation session at the monastery, and. Um, that was all, all very strange. I expected it to be difficult because of the rule of not eating after no, after 12 midday. So I thought, gosh, you know, I'm not going to be able to eat between 12 midday and I think it was about 8am the next day that you had breakfast uh, after getting up at 5am and doing morning meditation. Um, but no, that, that that came quite easy actually because when there wasn't food available to nibble on so if you knew you weren't getting food you didn't worry about it. What did intrigue me was um, the idea of noble silence. So this idea of going to one of these retreats and meeting fellow Buddhists, you weren't allowed to talk to them or talk to anybody, <laughs> which was, was quite strange. And so for the whole five days, um, apart from maybe asking the, the leader, the meditation leader, Ajahn Tiradhamma, some questions, there's no talking and it's quite surprising that there was no I didn't miss not talking after a while and we all just walked there was about um, 10 or 12 people on this retreat I suppose and you you know the evening you just wander off to your little hut somewhere and then you come back in the morning and be around other people and it's all just done very quietly and everybody seemed to know what to do and what time and and so on. So it, it, that was very, very relaxing actually. And it's quite, quite interesting, even though you'd never had not talked to these other people, by the end of the five days you did feel you sort of bonded with them. That was quite, quite nice. Um, in 2008, so it's the same year, about two or three months later I came to, the, to England and I'd just throw this in because uh, how seriously I was taking Buddhism so I looked on um, a website wondering if I would stay in England and perhaps take a job in England at that time and uh, there was actually a job ad come up for a monastery in, in Worcestershire and uh, the abbot there was looking for a, somebody to drive him around to his various pastoral visits that he had to make and um, so I, uh, I, I went along and had an interview and so on and so forth, but I, I just after I had the interview and I thought, well, maybe this is a bridge too far. I had to live a monastic life basically uh, at this monastery, which was miles from anywhere. And this was a sort of large converted Victorian house, you know, so you had one room and a bed on the floor. I thought, well, maybe that's going a bit too far. So um, I said, thanks for the job offer, but no thanks. So because um, I don't, I don't really see uh, uh, Buddhism as a religion. You see, uh, I, it's more a philosophy. So there is no God or higher being, as you get in the Abrahamic religions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Um, and there's also no missionary zeal to Buddhism. So you don't go out and proselytize, if that's the right word. Um, if you want to know about Buddhism, you have to go to a Buddhist and ask. He won't come to you and tell you. So, um, but I did have a great understanding when I first started. A great difficulty understanding the um, some of the concepts of about Buddhism, things like the the Four Noble Truths, the Aggregates, the Eightfold Path. Um, so I had a lot to study, even though I wasn't mingling with other Buddhists uh, about. Buddhism and that was available in books and also on the internet of course uh, and the nice thing about the internet is that if you can't find a definition that you understand you just keep on going so I've just got down here that um, for example I was looking up the divine abodes of Brahma Vihara 
and you put that into Google and you get 360,000 references back. I'm sure one of them will probably make sense. So um, I, d I have spent a lot of time studying um, the sort of concepts of Buddhism and the way it works and to uh, make sure I don't forget these concepts that will make up my own mnemonics or as an aid memoir. So for the aggregate, for example, my aid memoir is um, my father Peter makes cakes, MFPMC. And for the Eightfold Path, my um, memory joggers, Visa Lamp, V I S A L E M C. And for the hindrances, it's Sidgrid. Um, for the Three Roots of Evil, GHD, which is a well known hair straightener. And for the Four Divine Abodes, Kum, K U M M. So for the Four Noble Truths, that there, there is discontent. Now again, this is another thing that bothered me for quite a while, is the, the common translation of Dukkha is suffering. There is, there is suffering, but I don't know how, how in the, a Western world can uh, how I exist be described as suffering. I wouldn't call it suffering, I'd just call it discontent. So that was, to my mind, a better translation of Dukkha. And then the uh, second noble truth, there is a cause to discontent. And third noble truth, that there's a resolution to the discontent. And the fourth, uh, the resolution is by following the Eightfold Path. Um, and the Eightfold Path, as I say, is Vigalemp, v Visa Lemp, which is right view, right intent, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And then there's the, so the five hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, drowsiness, restlessness and doubt. The, and the precepts, so those are the five precepts of do no harm to others. Do not take that which is not freely given. Do not take part in unwanted sexual activity. Do not contribute to wrong speech or gossip. Refrain from intoxicants. And when staying at the monastery, it's an eight, eightfold path, uh, eight precepts. So the other three are do not use body adornments and do not sleep on high beds. Do not eat after noon. And then the three roots of evil, GHD, greed, hatred, delusion. The five aggregates, which are material form, feelings, which lead to desires, which leads to cravings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness. So, yeah, the five aggregates, um, which I remember as being my father, Peter, makes cakes, material form, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness. And then the three characteristics of existence, anatta, which is non-self, dukkha, discontent, and anika, impermanence. And the four divine abodes, karuna, or compassion, upekka, equanimity, mudita, reciprocal, reciprocal joy, and metta, loving kindness. Uh, so those are the main concepts around Buddhism. But there's also the whole area that's a bit harder to take on board. And sort of the basic ideas of during the, Buddh the Buddhist era that the basic elements were earth, air, fire and water. Well, not were, but are earth, air, fire and water. And um, the Buddhist cosmos, cosmos, which is explained with its 30 planes or realms of existence. So there's that in the background. I sort of try and, I say, reconcile that with what was common understanding at the time. Anyway, continuing my journey on in time. So on 2010, I visited a Buddhist monastery, I think near Hemel Hempstead in, um, in the UK and also took a short visit on my way back to New Zealand to Thailand and uh, so I was quite interested in observing the 
Buddhism in a country that has a Buddhist tradition rather than being sort of a special one-off just the same as it's interesting to observe Islam in an um, Islamic country it's like visiting Morocco during the time of Ramadan seeing how, how the effect is on the society so that was quite enlightening to visit um, Thailand and visit the monasteries there and 2010-2012 um, I sort of tried to find a community for Buddhist practice. I, I joined a group in Wellington, uh, but didn't feel particularly comfortable there. I continued with sort of monthly formal practice at the monastery, but again, you know, I didn't feel overly comfortable with that. Um, there are only only about five or six people, which is okay, but um, the acoustics in the meeting hall or the sala. I mean, I couldn't hear the instructions, I mean, my hearing's not too good. So I felt sort of distance rather than included. I only went to one Sunday evening puja, puja sort of formal uh, celebration. Uh, but I, I just found it too ritualistic. So it was um, <coughs> communal, <coughs> communal chanting and so on. Uh, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I found it sort of mimicked the format of a Christian church service too much with its hymns, prayers and sermons. So um, I didn't go on. So I suppose about that time my practice wavered. Um, I was sort of still interested in the philosophy, but I couldn't reconcile that with the practice I was seeing locally. But then, as I was saying, 2012, I just happened to glance in the local newspaper, there was some chap called Banta Gunaratana who was going to come to the neighbourhood to give a talk. And I think he was invited by the, there's a Sri Lankan Buddhist monastery nearby, or a small monastery nearby. And um, so you can actually look, look this chap up, Banta Gunaratana, who's on Facebook. He's now 95 years old and still active. And um, it was at that meeting, which um, to me it's quite memorable, it, it, was, it was only a small building, but it was crowded with sort of say 70, 80 people. And it sort of held the audience with what, with what he was saying. And, it, and the, the, way, the way he know, imparted his knowledge and talked about Buddhism, with a sort of mixture of seriousness and humour. Um, so yeah, he was a very good speaker. And, and that sort of took a, a, a turning point in my acceptance and understanding of Buddhism. And uh, I went on to read Bhante Gurunathana's autobiography, which I found quite interesting. And he's actually now practising in the USA, although he was born in Sri Lanka. And obviously read his book on mindfulness, that's well known. And his second book on meditation. So 2012 to about 2014 I was doing, I call it home meditation. So I was doing it quite respectfully, I suppose. So I'd prepare meals for, say, five days. And I'd wake at 5am, start the meditation day wouldn't eat after 12 midday and in the late afternoons early evenings I'll perhaps listen to a, a Buddhist talk say from Bhanta Gurunatta or the Dalai Lama or whoever so I'd moved away really from the rituals you encounter in monasteries uh, uh, but I was sort of grateful obviously grateful to the monasteries and the, Bud and the monks for keeping the Buddhist traditions alive. So I went in more into learning about the jhana states, the eight jhana states, and again I was using, um, in this case, Lee Brassington's book on right concentration, which is quite interesting, and um, again Bhante Gurunatta's book on them um, called Beyond Mindfulness in Plain English. So I found with all this meditation I was doing, it was at least an hour a day, if not two hours a day. There didn't seem any sort of flow on into normal daily life. 
um, didn't sort of eventuate. I became a calmer, more rational person. Not oh, I didn't. I didn't feel so. Um, my my loving kindness improved all meta because I was doing loving kindness meditation. And I think that helped a huge deal. Um, I saw no improvement in my equanimity, or upeka, which is part of the divine abodes. I was still road raging in traffic and such like, so I couldn't quite make the connection between this calmness of mind with Buddhism and how it actually worked in the real world when you weren't sitting on a mat meditating. So I gave up this idea of heavy duty meditation and I thought maybe I could make a better connection with Buddhism and its way of life by reading the Pali Canon and stud studying the Pali language. So as I understand it, that the Pali Canon, the original works were written in Pali. So I knew the Pali language, I might get a better understanding of Pali. And I thought from studying the original texts, I wouldn't get bombarded by all these different thoughts and opinions you get when you read the internet and all the different websites and everything else. So I took on board Buddha's saying that find out for yourself. Do not accept what you are told, find out for yourself. So I spent about two years, 2016, 2018, learning Pali and studying the, um, uh, the Pali canon translations. Um, which were done by um, the monks Bodhi and Tanisaro. Some was online, some not online, so I actually bought the books so I could study them. And um, again, that's sort of quite a different viewpoint there because I found that in the Pali texts, or the Pali canons, Buddha repeatedly expressing that meditation which is seen as one of the pillars of Western Buddhism, that meditation is merely pleasant abiding. That's not a miracle, it's not a miracle cure to life's woes, as seen as it seemingly expressed in a lot of Western Buddhist practices, or in fact it's been taken on as a generic practice. So I'd, I'd still emphasise that um, practising loving-kindness meditation made me hugely calm and more rational towards other people's behaviours. But um, as for changing my equanimity in daily life actions, I didn't find much difference. So this studying the Pali canon set me on a new journey of discovery. So it was things like understanding better Indian philosophical arguments with tetralemmas and katuskotis and... Um, I found the vindication of learning Pali if I didn't understand the translation in the um, Bhikkhu Bodhi version of the Pali Canon or the Tanisaro, then I'd go to the Pali and try and pick my way through the parts to get a, another interpretation. So that worked quite well. Um, so there was also things like trying to resolve conflicts of information in the Pali Canon, so saying that the taints and all the asavas can't be resolved by meditation. Um, the asavas really can't be, well they can be blocked out but that's not the true way of dealing with it, it's more to do is to eradicate um, them. And there's also the concept of non-self <coughs> that um, is quite a, a strong debating point in the Buddhist world. But then again, you know, Buddha dismissed it as not worth thinking about. Um, you know, the concept of self is an artifice, but um, it's not worth spending a lot of time thinking about it. So I also found um, reading the suttas or the Pali Canon that sort of humanises Buddha. So uh, from reading the, the chapters I've read to date, uh, it seems that Buddha has a lot of patience and tolerance for those seeking information about Buddhism. 
Um, you know, for example, on the chapter, we were talking to a couple of people who, who they thought the purest way of living was to behave like animals, like a dog and a cow. But some Buddha persuaded them it wasn't quite the way to do it. But on the other hand, he had intolerance for those of his followers whose faith had wavered or strayed, so he was quite harsh on those. Um, so, and in fact, Buddhism is also a fairly new term for that philosophy. So I think it used to be referred to, or maybe still be referred to in um, Asian countries as the Dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A, -M -M the way or the path. And then I'll say, as I, I noted before, that it, we come across a lot of more information about the Buddhist cosmology, the the world, the realms, the hungry ghosts, Mara, Debas. Um, but I, I, I thought, well, this is the way it was in, in the ancient world. They were uh, as commonly accepted, say, as in um, ancient Greek culture with the gods who lived and, and mixed with mortals. It was just the same concept in, in um, Buddha's times. So I sort of take that on board. And um, again, the concept of rebirth. And some are trying to push the point that um, maybe rebirth is the fact that we are reborn with each separate thought we have. So the you know 70 year old me is different from the 10 year old me. So have I been reborn? But um, although we're trying to, although some people say I'm cling to that notion, it definitively states in the Pali Canon that, um, that before rebirth can occur, physical death and decay occurs. So, so that, and I think Stephen Batchelor in the West, who's brought on the concept of what he's called secular Buddhism. So he's the one who sort of, I think, I haven't actually read his book, I think the view is that rebirth is more about changes of thought and way of life rather than physical birth. Um, but I look at it that the whole concept again of rebirth is what was accepted at the time, whether you were a Buddhist, a Jainist, a Hindu or an Ajivika. Um, and the difference between the different philosophies is that in Buddhism there's no concept of a soul, S-O-U-L which goes from existence to existence. So I sort of take that on board. And then um, all these things are wandering around in my mind without any um, resolution really, just accept them as being conundrums. But then last year, 2019, I came across this monk who's probably not as well known in the West because he died before the internet became popular and um, he was very focused on Thai rather than expanding Buddhism. And a chap called Buddha Dasa, which translates as servant of Buddha. Um, and he holds the logic of Atamayata and Sunatta. And this is mentioned by Buddha in the Pali Canon but hasn't really had any uptake or much uptake in, in, in Western Buddhism. So Atamata is that, that there is that is translated as there is no that. There is no suchness. So some event occurs and you just accept that event as an event, observe it and, and move on. And you don't start tunneling through and um, finding out causes, wants and so on and so forth. And so it's just basically translated as there is no that. There is this, but there is no that. So atamayata, there is no that. And sunyata, it just means avoid. And that the practice of meditation really is to meditate on the void, <clears throat> on the nothingness. Now, the only thing that interrupts this nothingness 
is the basic senses. So there's nothing apart from the input of the basic senses of taste, hearing, touch, smell and sight. So those are just part of us as an entity, but otherwise it's a void. A void, not a void, a void. So it's not a concentration on the breath or other functions, than a vipassana meditation, but concentration on the void, on the void, which is naturally repeatedly interrupted by cognition of the physical sensory inputs, and there's nothing beyond that. So I've sort of changed my interpretation of the divine abodes. So instead of being K-U-M-M, cum, it's K-U-M-M-A-S, kumas, which is karuna, which is compassion, tik, upeka, equanimity, tik, mudita, which is reciprocal joy, and uh, loving kindness, Meta. And the additions, the AS is Atamayata, know that, and Sunyata, voidness. But again, having accepted that, or working that into my philosophy, that if there is no that, Atamayata, there is no that. There's no causal effect, I don't go down that track. How does that fit in with the basic Buddhism tenet of dependent origination? That everything has a previous cause. So I'm still working on that one. <laughs> um, so yeah, if, um, it's all still a work in progress. Um, I thought after 12 years I sort of decided to check in to where I got to and I do think this um, idea of developing the extended divine abodes is the way to go. I may be back in another 10 years, who knows. Thanks for watching.